So welcome everyone. Um, we're here to talk about security for Basel, uh, mostly focusing on compliance and all the stuff around that. So let's do a quick introduction. So the guy next to me is Yannick Bonnenberg, bon, bon something. Uh, he's a software engineer at Engflow. Uh, his pastime is breaking production on the weekend, but only when he's not on call. And this is Antonio, um, and he's, he's really obsessed with ducks. I mean, look at this. Yeah, it's kind of my thing. But I'm not obsessed with just ducks. I also really care about software supply chain security. So it's kind of the reason why we're here. Like, they accepted this talk. We're here in front of the audience. We already messed up with the slides. Go, but why are we doing this? So there's a few reasons why we want to talk about supply chain security. Uh, the first and obvious one is the compliance and regulatory requirements. Those tend to be compulsory. So if you're selling software or you're even using software, sometimes you have to abide by certain regulations, which can be local, they can be for the country, for the state, or they can just be because a business imposes them. So if you're working with pharma, you may have different regulations than someone working with the military. Uh, but not just that, the second obvious thing is you want to have, uh, you, you, want, you care about security, hopefully. Uh, most of us care about security, and you care about vulnerability management. You want to know, for example, if you're using Log4j, which version of Log4j you're using, because you know, some are not, are not that great. Um, and if something happens, you want to understand what happened. You want to be able to look at your dependencies, how they've been built, and if there is a problem, you want to be able to narrow it down. Let's say that you've got a problem in your software and the JSON parser doesn't work. There is a bug there. And you find out that you're using an old version of your JSON parser or it's been built with the wrong flags. You want to be able to assert as quickly as possible that that is the root cause of your problem. And that in turn leads to faster incident response. And the final point, which I guess is, sounds less important, it's less technical, is you do want to be trust with your customers. You want to be able to give them software for which you're accounting for each bit. So each bit of your final artifacts has to be accounted for when you're talking about software supply chain security. So how would you even do that, though? And the tool for doing that is SBOMS. And SBOM stands for uh, Software Bill of Materials, I guess. Yes, that's what the slides say. And it's this machine-readable uh, file that's it's not often read. You, you create it in case something happens. You create it because some entities may need to read it to assert that your software is secure in their environment. And for that reason, it needs to do two things. And I was talking the other day with Tony and the rest of the supply chain gang. And Really, it's, it's kind of similar to writing a recipe after you've cooked it. Uh, because you, you look at the recipe and it's like you need apples, you need fish, you need this and that. Then you need to boil it and do something. But the reality of cooking food is that oftentimes you're cooking the fish, but you, you burnt it. Uh, just burned it to a crisp. And the apples, they're five weeks old. You forgot them on the counter, now they're squishy. Uh, and so you replace them with another thing. And so you have these ingredients, but you also have the process which you, go, which you went through. And we, can, we think of this as dependencies and provenance. So dependencies, those are more obvious. These are the things that you pull in from third parties into your code. So let's say our beloved log4j, uh, or maybe, I don't know, any other dependency you can think of. And the provenance is how you've built things. So what processor you, the machine you've built this action on was using. Uh, where, it was the, where, where this machine was deployed, if it was a dev machine or if it was a CI machine, and all of these things need to be collected into this homogeneous contract that we call an S-bomb, right? And S-bombs in, come in all forms and shapes. Some are standardized, like Cyclone DX and SPDX. But the reality is that oftentimes we see different vendors or different uh, buyers have their own standards, right? Either internal standards or somewhat public and well-known standards, but it's a very heterogeneous uh, kind of market where you have a plethora of file formats and different requirements. So to summarize, what goes into an SBOM? So we've seen that we're gonna have dependencies, so all the third-party packages, the information's about the tool chains that you've used. So I've used Clang versus I've used GCC versus, God forbid, I've used MSVC. Um, 
but also like potentially you address bombs. Sometimes, especially in Java, I've seen that a lot, you're importing packages that have already, pre have already been pre-built, right? So you're importing a jar, and in that case, you can't say you have built this, in this on this machine with this configuration because it's already been built for you. In which case, the thing you should be able to do is import other S-bombs. So S-bombs are by nature mergeable. They need to be mergeable. But in Angel, we also have our own requirements. And now Yannick is going to explain what we've done for our own software. Yes. So anyone this? There you go. <laughs> Uh, at Enflow, um, we've been founded about four and a half years ago, and we have pretty much all of our software in a single modern repo, and we do check in most of our dependencies. Um, especially in more recent times, we, we started using a more of like workspace dependencies or Bazel mod, so not everything is checked in anymore. Um, and you know, we we actually ship software to our customers. Um, and we do use some certain uh, third-party libraries, like, for example, Guava. And if you use any third-party open source libraries, then they usually come with a license, and they usually require you to ship that license uh, to your customers, or at least tell your customers that, hey, we're using this library. Um, so for every package that we build and ship, we will need to include at least the licenses, which is one part of the S-bomb. Um, and those licenses and what we ship, sometimes it needs to be in a very specific format because the deployment target we deploy to requires that. Um, that can either be because the government requires something or because the cloud requires it to be in a very specific format. So, um, you know, we can't, we can't uh, deploy that in any form we would like. We will need to follow what's required. Um, when we started, there was no standard in Basel for doing any supply chain or licensing management. Um, there was the old license function target thing that behaved very differently to today, and that only declared the, like, the kind of license. Was it a notice license, like Apache 2, MIT, BSD? Was it a restrictive license, like... Um, TPL or similar licenses? Was it a commercial license that only very specific targets can actually depend on because we talked to the vendor and they gave us a very specific license just to deploy in that very specific product, like let's say only for Mac OS? Um, and something like Roots license that I think most of you have heard, at, le at least heard about, um, it has been featured in a couple of Basil contacts talks in the past few years um, just also didn't exist yet. So we needed something to collect all those licenses, at least, and figure out what goes into our software. There was no, st there was no standard solution, so we built our own. What did that look like? Um, so this is from roughly four years ago. Um, we, we introduced, uh, so we did this in Basil. We introduced a new rule called license that uh, declared the type of license, the name of the package, where we got it from, information that we needed, and the license file, of course. And then we put that next to every, for example, imported char file. This was right next to the imported guava char file. And then more top level, where we built our binary, we had something called the license collection, which uh, was a collection of licenses, and you had to specify every license that you transitively depended on manually. Now, I think you can already see where this is going. It's very easy to just get wrong. And if you add a new library to somewhere in third party and start using it, um, you just forget to add it. Or you remove a dependency, and you forget to remove the dependency from the license target. Uh, so this was very error prone to do. Then uh, later on, we improved things a bit um, by using an aspect to collect all the licenses. So the way this worked is that we still had the license target right next to the, uh, to the jar file in this example. Um, but we put it into a very special attribute that Tony added three or four years ago, 
um, that is automatically propagated to every single target in the packet. And then we had an aspect uh, top level to collect transitively everything that depends on. Uh, that the uh, that the target depends on, and this ensures that everything that every license that we include in the final license output file is exactly the licenses that we used. Um, collecting this via an aspect unfortunately requires you to know which exact attribute from from like for example the Java library target end up in the final binary. So. For example, the depth is usually, this is a compile time dependency. We do ship this, unless it sets never link, of course. Um, and that, 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 there's a lot of edge cases, so the aspect to collect this gets very, very complicated. And the other problem is that uh, if you use Basil's toolchain feature to uh, depend on your toolchains, you may not uh, actually get the licenses from the toolchain. Uh, it turns out in practice that's not a problem because usually, let, let's say you have a toolchain dependency on protobuf, you, you will be using protobuf as an explicit dependency somewhere in your tree. So in practice, this is fine. Um, and as I said before, as of right now, it is still necessary for us to manually create lots of these license targets that contain the package information. Um, into our third party tree and for workspace dependencies or basal mod dependencies, we also have to patch all of them to get that information into the target, which is a lot of complexity. Um, and as I already said, collecting it via the aspect is tricky as the aspect has to know about literally every single rule that you use and exactly what it's doing. Um, which if you're using a lot of different rules because you have a lot of different languages in your repository, that, that can get tricky. So as you've seen, we've, we've mostly been using our own customized rules, but over time we do want to get uh, to adopt rules license. So that's, that's one of our goals. We're here to talk about rules license, right? Yeah, we don't use it. Um, so let's talk about what rules license does, what it is, and what are the current gaps. So it's this rules, li rules license is this rule set, this part of the Basel Bit organization, GitHub. Yeah, as pointed out yesterday, that means that it's open source and managed by the Basel community itself. Uh, the, the, the three main rules you really care about are license kind, that allows you to declare uh, a license in isolation, just the license not bound to any target. Uh, like, I don't know, MIT license, Apache 2, or anything like that. Then there is the license target. The license rule allows you to bind that license to an actual specific target. And finally, probably the one I care about the most is generate SBOM, which is kind of says what it does from the name. It allows you to generate an SBOM. Sadly, that SBOM is currently on SPDX, uh, but more formats to come. We're about that later. Uh, Something we really care about is that rule sets need to be able to integrate with rules license, right? So if you're importing your dependencies with rules external, uh, JVM external, you don't want to have to rewrite all that infrastructure yourself to be able to propagate licenses. So in that case, rules JVM external needs to be able to propagate the information we need inside rules licenses to be able to generate as bombs and other artifacts. And so for that reason, uh, the, the rule set provides mostly two providers, which are license info and package info. Uh, but it also provides a few utilities to gather those, um, those informations from the user side, like gather metadata info that allows you to gather a bunch of licenses and have everything into a single transitive metadata info provider. Now, this is all cool and dandy, but um, even though we just recently released the 1.0 version, which is Basel mod ready, uh, the SBOM support is still very much in its infancy. Um, as I've mentioned before, we don't really have any mechanism to generate any format aside from SPDX. Luckily, I've just sent up PR to Tony, hey Tony, um, to support our, our arbitrary tool chains that allow you to generate uh, other formats other than SPDX. So if you're using Cyclone DX, you're gonna need to implement your own tool chain, but now it is possible to, to use it. 
There is no support for gathering transitive S-bombs, so that's, some, that's a requirement I've mentioned later. If you're using pre-built dependencies, you do need to gather S-bombs that, uh, that come from outside, so uh, I, I don't see that support yet. Um, and finally, the workspace S-bomb support is still in very much in its infancy. It's something that we've built during an hackathon last year, and it's stayed in that fashion uh, up until now. Um, that allows you to, to look at the workspace, uh, actually at the external package, and list all the dependencies that it finds. It, it does kind of work, but it's very much in its infancy. Okay, now we talked a lot about licenses so far, which is definitely a very important part of supply chain security, um, but it's not the only part. And uh, for safeguarding again, like, so with supply, so with supply chain security, the thing that we care about is that if something goes wrong, we can find out that it went wrong and what went wrong, where it went wrong. Think of the recent, uh, what was it, XY exploit, the uh, the compression library exploit, XC, XC, sorry, not XY, XC, uh, <laughs> mixing letters up. Uh, exploit where someone was injecting malicious code into a very commonly used library um, and having an S bomb there would have helped everyone to figure out are we somehow transitively depending on this and shipping this into production. Um, and this is where Salsa comes in. Salsa is a framework uh, um, for safeguarding the artifact integrity for the so whole software supply chain. Um, again, there has been talks in the previous BaselCon about this. I think Tony gave one two years ago. Um, if you're interested, go to the website. Um, but the, in short, there's, two, uh, there's four levels of security for the build artifacts that you're shipping to production. The first level is there's no guarantees. Uh, you're not using Salsa pretty much. And everyone trivially satisfies that requirement. The first level is that you have some provenance and you do generate an S-bomb and you know what went into your binary, but it's very easy to uh, modify, like there's no cryptographic uh, verification of anything, um, and you can just modify it. The, the next level is level two, where all your builds run on a hosted build platform, so I'm no longer able to build releases on my laptop. <laughs> um, which gives you some additional guarantees and has some additional requirements. And then the last level is that you have hardened builds. You really know exactly what went into your build, and it's pretty much impossible to modify your build and inject things that shouldn't be there unless you have access to those trusted systems. Um, so as I already said, level zero is trivially uh, satisfied by every single build. That pretty much says there's no protection. Um, for, for level one, you will need to use something like, for example, root licenses to generate an S-bomb um, and potentially also ship that to your customers. But um, there's no requirement here on signing the S-bomb to verify its integrity, for example. So I can build the S-bomb, I can build the software on my local machine here, and uh, that will spill out, that will, that will produce an S-bomb, but I can modify it, which, I mean, it's better than not having nothing at all, but it's still not great. Uh, for level two, um, that requires generation of the provenance, so, you know, every level is kind of additive here, so everything that level one gives you, or level two gives you as well, plus more. Um, but in this case, the S-bomb needs to be signed to make sure that, to, or to verify later on that this was produced by the CI machine, for example, and not on my laptop, to make sure that uh, I didn't somehow modify the S-bomb to remove that malicious library that I injected. Um, it does require that every build runs on a trusted, so-called trusted platform, like for example, doing all release builds on CI. I think that is a good practice regardless. Um, 
And it also must allow that every artifact that is used by the build does only come from that trusted environment, which is important if you use something for like remote execution or remote caching. Now, there is level three, uh, which requires additional things like uh, that builds actions within a build or within a single project do not influence each other and cannot modify each other. Um, and that even cached artifacts must really prove their authenticity. So especially caching is important here. Um, for level two, if we, for example, only allow the CI to write to the remote cache and then read it back, that's fine. That's satisfy level two as far as uh, the the requirements are concerned. For level three, on the other hand, if we download the artifact, we can still use caching, but we will need to verify that um, that the that the artifact was actually produced by the trusted system and not from me again on my local laptop running some actions against the remote cache and uploading it. Um, so where does this go? how does this play all with remote execution and caching? So remote execu execution and caching does, use, uh, does provide a very convenient way to speed up builds, and a lot of you are using at least caching here. Um, for uh, the remote execution or remote caching is kind of split into two parts. There is, on one hand, the CAS, which is concerned about all the input and output artifacts, so the source files the, and the final binary and every intermediate char or shared library or whatnot. Um, they are referenced by their digest, which typically uses a secure, um, cryptographically secure hashing function like char256. Um, and if if the digest matches, we know that this is what it's supposed to be. Um, for the action cache, on the other hand, that is kind of an arbitrary map from all of the action, from the action descriptor, which is all the inputs, all the environment variables, the whole command line, and a couple of other things, to uh, the final output, which is, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of things in there, but it's like the, the output binary that was produced by the action. And unfortunately, there's no built-in uh, verification there. That uh, it's an arbitrary mapping between two different between the key, which is the action key, and the value, which is the so-called action result. And there's there's no verification step anywhere to make sure that the output was actually produced by that key. Um, in, in a bit more details, uh, this is what the action result looks like. It has the output files, it has symlinks, it has directories. It has the exit code, it has the standard error and standard out of the, of the action, it has some metadata. Now, there's no verification in there. Um, we cannot prove who produced the output or who, who, who produced this. Um, and we also don't know anything about the machine that ran this on, right? Was this, even on CI, an action that was executed locally? Or if I'm using remote execution, was this produced by the remote execution cluster? We, we just don't really know. Now, the execution metadata does give you some information, but again, I can just modify it. There's no verification. So to summarize, uh, this is very much off topic, and industry leaders are focusing on it, industry leaders and Tony. Uh, and this is something like that is getting better, but it's still not there. We have some ob obvious gaps in the rule set itself, in rules license, but there are also some deeper gaps in the APIs that Yannick just mentioned. So even the remote APIs, they need to be extended to truly support these use cases. At least we're making some steps, and I think it's a really good sign to see the first uh, first one point to release of uh, of rules license, and it being Basel mod ready. So some closing words: we are we have launched this survey that I think you can get to by scanning the QR code. Yeah, oh dang it! Uh, there's supposed to be a QR code, which I'm gonna let Yannick draw. Because uh, apparently it's not showing, um, but yeah, the, the, 
We're going to share it somehow later on. Also, the slides are accessible online. Yeah. On the Slack channel, yeah, we, there is a Slack channel called Supply, thank you, Supply Chain Security that you can join where we're going to be resharing the survey. Hopefully, this time it's going to work. You can also join the mailing list, Basel SCC Google Groups. And finally, after the quick break in the last 15 minutes, we're going to have this Birds of a Feather session uh, where we're going to talk more extensively about rules license and its future. Uh, so you mentioned with cryptographic signatures of uh, action results. It does seem like, at least with remote execution, that is something that could be added to the, to the protocol buffer definition there. And so this, this is a solvable problem, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is, this is definitely a solvable problem, right? Um, right now, the API doesn't provide you any standard uh, way to do this. Um, if you're using remote execution, it's actually, like, if you're using remote execution and you don't allow the client, in this case, Basil, to upload to the action cache, you are somewhat better because you know this was produced by the remote execution system. Um, I, there's, there's, like, we need to modify the protocol a bit, but it's a solvable problem, yes. It, okay. are, are there plans to do that? Sorry? Uh, are, are, are there plans to actually do that, to modify that protocol? You ask if there are any plans to do that. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I, couldn't, I didn't get your question. Uh, the, the question is, is there a plan to actually do that? It, it's possible, yes. Is it going to happen? Uh, I was talking to Tiago yesterday about this exact thing. Um, we will need to figure out how exactly we are going to fit this into the remote execution protocol. There have been talks about potentially doing a V3, potentially modifying V2 to allow certain things, like for example this. Um, we don't know yet what it looks like, but we started talking about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would also like to add that like, it'd be interesting to see if there's a way uh, to extend the protocol so that you don't need to trust the remote execution provider to give you the correct information. Because at, at any point, you shouldn't trust any of, on any of your vendors when you produce as bombs and compliance information. Okay. So if you can think of any solution to this problem, uh, please reach out to either of us. Uh, yes, or come to the uh, BOF session that starts in 15-ish minutes. Over there in the other room. Um, and yes, uh, the remote execution can give you that information, but then again, your remote execution cluster might be compromised and you want to catch that as well. Yeah. Um, thanks for the great summary. You really captured the state of the art and the problems. Uh, so I don't really have a question other than what recipe has apples and fish together? <laughs> oh. Uh, I don't know, fish crumb? You're making it. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, yeah. It, it is a community effort, which is the point you mentioned. And, and it's, we all know there are problems and deficiencies, and we're trying to push each other to fill in the gaps as we're discovering what customers really need. Um, so we're not, uh, Google isn't trying to throw things over the wall here that'll solve all your problems, because I think, as you stated, no one knows all the problems. Customers have different needs, so flexibility is what we're shooting yeah, for. And, and that's why we really need you to yeah. fill out the form. Yeah. Like The requirements change. They're different for each one of us. Uh, and we really need to build something that is flexible and can be adapted to that. Also, I want to take this chance to do a round of applause for Tony, yeah. who's been leading this oh, effort. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>